The Kirby games are loved by fans for many reasons. They're cute, they're fun, they're creative, and occasionally they're surprisingly morbid. As adorable as the world of Kirby is, it has its moments that range from a little bit creepy to borderline horror. I'm Kivinosi with 1UP Binge, and this is Dark Kirby Moments, gruesome to most gruesome. Where else can we begin but the beginning of the series, Kirby's battle with the Nightmare Wizard. It didn't take Kirby long at all to start getting pretty intense, at least compared to what you'd expect from the cute and cuddly aesthetics. Seriously, just look at this adorable Japanese commercial. Aww. Naturally, 2D platformers aren't the most story-focused games around, especially ones from the early 90s. Imagine then the surprise of the second game in the Kirby series having a genuine plot twist, escalating the conflict from a pudgy Penguin King stealing food to that same pudgy Penguin King trying desperately to contain a villainous wizard who psychologically tortures the citizens of Dreamland with nightmares, taking away their dreams in the process. Rightfully concerned, Kirby takes DDD down and returns a Star Rod, which releases Nightmare into the world. Honestly, there's nothing particularly scary about this guy, unless you count that ridiculously loud death scream, but it's significant enough to mention for the fact that it kickstarted Kirby's decades long streak of unexpectedly terrifying final bosses. And where would that streak be without the very next villain in the series, Dark Matter? When DDD realized he had a moral compass in the second game, it seems like the devs realized they still kinda needed a villain, and DDD was was pretty popular, so the solution? Have him repeatedly possessed by dark forces beyond our comprehension. This leads to varying degrees of danger and general body horror, whether it's him having his stomach being ripped open Pac-Man style in Dreamland 3 and Kirby 64, or him becoming absolutely jacked in Star Allies. DDD isn't the only victim though, turn your attention to the bad ending of Kirby 64. If you beat the game without collecting all the crystal shards, you're treated to a heartfelt goodbye from Kirby and the gang to Ripple Star, followed by an ominous glare from the Fairy Queen, revealing that Dark Matter is alive and well, and after the credits roll, it won't be too hard for it to take over again with Kirby away. It's pretty darn ominous stuff that's only not higher because, well, first of all, this series just keeps out doing itself, but as far as demon possession goes in the Kirby series, as weird as it is to say this, we're honestly just used to it by now. Kinda like DDD probably is. Just like we're used to fighting the villains' as souls as true final bosses, but that wasn't always the case. Enter Drasha Soul. What? It's just an ordinary Mary Kirby final, oh my goodness! Okay, this absolute masterpiece from hell is Drasha's final form, brought out in a last ditch effort to annihilate Kirby. Drasha was honestly already one of the scariest villains in the franchise, given her ability to delim Kirby and change the very fabric of the universe, but this first soul fight of the series escalated that status even further. The chaotic music and attacks combined with this freaky design make this one of the most frantic, panic-inducing bosses in the Kirby series. But like with the last entry, while this fight has the benefit of being the first of its kind, Kind, it's still a fight that pales in comparison to later soul-smiting battles in the series. Like, for example, the very first villain in the series who Kirby 100% canonically murdered. Everyone take a bow for the tragedy of Queen Sectonia. The road to hell, and beauty in this case, is paved with good intentions. And poor little Taranza had to learn that the hard way. Although initially framed as the villain of Kirby Triple Deluxe, Taranza is later revealed in the series' lore to have once been a well-intentioned friend of the Queen. That said, he didn't want to stop at being just friends, at least we suspect as much, given that he managed to get his hands on the beautiful dimension mirror as a gift to remind her of how downright gorgeous she is. Sectonia appreciated the gesture. She loved the mirror, like really loved it, to the point where she stared at her reflection so much that Dark Meta Knight successfully corrupted her, transforming her into a tyrant who cruelly oppressed her subjects and forced Taranza to do the same. In her true arena battle, this goes from depressing to a little disturbing. After seemingly taking her down, she tears her own head off of her body in sheer desperation borrowing attacks from other soul bosses who've appeared throughout the series. If there's anything scarier than the soul of Sectonia, it's the prospect of losing to her incredibly hard boss fight and having to go through the whole true arena again. Maybe hire an exorcist next time, Taranza. You'll get back out there one day. On today's episode of How Is This Man Still Alive, we now move on to Marx's soul. This is one of those events in the series you all knew would be here at some point. First of all, this is the first main series soul boss, which earns it some points for shock value. The true arena debuted with a bang in Superstar Ultra when a cinematic cutscene revealed that Marx was actually alive after his defeat. Big shock. This time, he's done screwing around. Absorbing Nova's power for himself, he becomes a more imposing version of his true form. This fight is basically Marx's original fight on crack. His attacks are way faster, his laughter is much more sinister and unhinged, the background is much darker, and alright, we all know the main part. If you don't, turn your volume down a bit. 
Yeah, no, the, the music didn't stop there. It was just that loud. Kirby's freakiest moments have evolved beyond jump scares since then, but we're not gonna act like this one isn't still genuinely surprising to see in a Kirby game, even if the shock does wear off after time. But if you ask just about any Kirby fan what doesn't wear off, it's the psychological fear of butterflies they developed thanks to Morphonite. You guys remember that SpongeBob episode, Wormy, where SpongeBob and Patrick mistake a butterfly as a monster that ate their new friend, Wormy, and it causes panic in the town, then they destroy the town trying to say, yeah. Morphonite is basically that, but if they were right. Based on a beta version of Meta Knight's design, Morphonite is one of the secret final bosses of Kirby Star Allies. Entering the arena as the cute, innocent orange butterfly Kirby is often seen playing with in cutscenes, he comes down to land on Galacta Knight, who, will remind you, is supposedly the strongest warrior in the galaxy, and just absorbs him. He's straight up gone. But of course, that's just post-game Kirby for you. It's intimidating, sure, but it's not canon, right? Uh, enter Kirby in the Forgotten Land, which substitutes a post-game mode for a set of remixed, harder levels that lead to the true final boss, Morpho Knight, who absorbs Soul Forgo and steals its powers to fight Kirby. We still have no clue what Morpho Knight actually wants, but he's one of the very few characters on a similar power level to Kirby, and the fact that it has no issue absorbing god-tier life forms is pretty terrifying. Really makes you see those scenes of him landing on Kirby in a different line. Huh. All right, now how about we take a break to visit our good buddy Magalore? Sure, we didn't get off on the right foot, but you gotta respect that he turned his life around, especially considering what could have happened. In the newest Kirby game, Kirby's Return to Dreamland Deluxe, highly recommend, by the way. Everything from the original game was brought back and refined to the extreme. Well, almost everything. Rip, scope, shot. This includes the true arena, which had a refreshing remaster of the original Wii version's Magalore Soul Battle, which, although hard for the standard of Kirby games at the time, is an absolute cakewalk compared to pretty much anything after it. This includes a secret second phase where the eyes representing Magalore's remaining soul disappear as a single apple is tossed out to heal Kirby and friends. If you listen closely, you can hear Magalore crying out for help in the background. Knowing that Magalore has canonically reformed and become friends with Kirby, it's all the harder to hear him being tortured by the Master Crown. It's clear that he regrets his actions, and Kirby is his last chance at being freed from his suffering. What's even scarier is that this could have very easily happened canonically. Master Crown was extremely close to overpowering Magalore even there, and here we see he would have been joining Sectonia and Haltman in the Great Beyond with just a little less luck. Speaking of which, it's time to finally discuss the death of Haltman. Max Prophet Haltman was an evil man for sure. He had no issue invading a highly populated planet of innocent people to harvest resources. That said, it's hard not to feel bad for him, at least a little. His descent into villainy and madness was the result of his daughter's disappearance to another dimension. Believing he'd never see her again, he poured all of his time and energy into the Haltman Works Company. This resulted in the creation of Stardream, the world's most brilliant computer with the power to grant wishes. President Haltman wanted to use Stardream to bring his daughter back, unaware that she was his secretary. But ironically, due to her interference, his mind was completely taken over by Stardream, and his soul was absorbed into it. In the true arena, this is all but confirmed as Stardream's Soul OS's pause menu descriptions include Haltman's inner monologues, and in the final phase you can hear him moaning in pain as you destroy the parts of Stardream's core. As you destroy these parts, his soul becomes fainter and fainter until there's absolutely nothing remaining of him. Say what you will about Sectonia's soul, at least she got to go out quickly. This man had to have his soul torn apart bit by bit. That's brutal, man. But as far as morbidly tragic villains are concerned, nothing quite tops the absolute bomb drop that is Void. For years, we've wondered what exactly Kirby was. Is he an alien, a star, a piece of bubblegum, a marshmallow? I was personally in the marshmallow camp for the longest time, but Star Allies debunked this theory. After defeating Highness and weakening the summoned Void Termina, its core is revealed to be a creature called Void, which looks a bit familiar? That's pretty creepy already. It looks like an unsettling, soulless version of Kirby, and worse still, when the final DLC update came out, it revealed that this was absolutely true at the end of the Ultimate Choice. Kirby is a reincarnation of Void, and therefore connected to the hive mind of Dark Matter, the only difference being that Kirby is made only of incorruptible, pure positive energy, as opposed to Void, who reaches the peak of sheer negative energy. Energy. The pause menu description reveals its hope that, upon being wiped out, it may be reincarnated as someone like Kirby. If this weren't brutal enough, when you take Void down, it smiles. Kirby is quite literally putting a manifestation of his own negative reincarnated energy out of its misery. Man, maybe these games are dark, huh? Speaking of dark, you didn't really think Dark Matter was out of the discussion already, right? <laughs> We've still got to mention Zero Two. Probably the most infamous dark moment in the Kirby series, Zero Two is the true final boss of Kirby 64. 
for the Crystal Shards. After collecting all of the Crystal Shards and defeating Miracle Matter, Darkstar can be accessed, and herein lies one of Kirby's most terrifying foes. Design-wise, it's more or less a cross between a bleeding eyeball and a fallen angel. Oh, and the angel wings also look like bloody red veins, which is just lovely. The red and black backgrounds complement this to make it even freakier, and did we mention that the aforementioned bleeding is its only method of attack? Mmm, very good. You're essentially shooting crystals into an eyeball, which is pretty cruel even for an absolute demon like Zero Two. It would be crazy if we had another, even scarier bleeding eyeball in the Kirby series. It's just so random, I don't know why I mentioned that. Well, for now, how about we settle for classic body horror? And here we are starting the top three with Fector Forgo. At the tail end of Kirby and the Forgotten Land's main story mode, it's revealed that Leon, and by extension the rest of the Beast Pack, has been brainwashed and controlled by Fecto Elphilus. Elphilin's evil half. Well, it, it, it looks like more than half, but still. After Leon is defeated, naturally, his usefulness to Fecto has expired, but can still act as flesh, right? Fecto breaks free of its prison to absorb Leon and countless other members of the Beast Pack into itself to create an absolutely horrifying amalgamation of the enemies you've been fighting throughout the game. As if this wasn't already the closest a Kirby game has gotten to legitimately fitting into the horror genre, it then chases you down a corridor, forcing you to run away as you chip away its health. Granted, it's a really easy phase, but still, the atmosphere is absolutely terrifying here. The cherry on top being the most unsettling music in the entire series. Well, second most terrifying music. Oh, you didn't think we were done with Canvas Curse, right? Nah, if you thought Drasha's soul was terrifying, check out World of Drasha. What's scarier than a villain who wants to reshape the world to fit their own twisted desires? A villain who has that aspiration and the means to actually do it. World of Drasha is the final area of Kirby Canvas Curse, and man if it doesn't completely contrast everything else about the game. This place is downright terrifying. From its eerie music that sounds somewhere between a heart monitor and an anxiety attack, to the weird painting enemies who just grin at you, not even trying to hinder progress, just happy to see you frightened, it's harrowing to think of what Popstar would have become if Drasha had fully succeeded. Think about it. This is the world of Drasha. It's such a short level, and it feels like the inside of an insane artist's mind. But as dark as the psychological side of horror can be, nothing quite tops the boss of Kirby's Dream Land 3, Zero. Okay, sure, purely in terms of design, he's not as scary as Zero 2, but Imagine if we took the shock of a bleeding eyeball final boss and put it into what is otherwise one of Kirby's cutest games. Kirby's Dream Land 3, which is godlike and you can fight me on that, has a pastel coloring book art style. Accent it with the adorable Gooey and six cuddly animal buddies, and you have the recipe for one of the most utterly precious video games out there. So, with that being considered, we have to wonder, what the f*** were they thinking with this? There's, there's just no way to explain this one. It doesn't fit the rest of the game. It doesn't tie into the villain's plan or anything. It's just... <laughs> an iris being bloodily ripped out from its cornea as it desperately tries to kill you with its own blood. This is not only the first instance of body horror in the series, it's by far the worst. Whether it's in terms of gore or just sheer shock value, Zero is a pretty easy choice for Kirby's most horrifying moment. 